allow myself to introduce myself. Um, so I thought I'd do this in kind of three different um, three different ways. I'm, or, uh, we're gonna I'm gonna give a talk. Um, we are there are gonna be some audience response questions because I know it's hard to stay awake after lunch and snack. Um, and then we're gonna do a demonstration on how to do an injection. But realistically, there's also another workshop where you get real hands-on practice with that, so I would highly recommend that. Um, I don't think it's necessary, per se, for us to actually show how to inject our nice volunteers, but I brought my favorite lucky needle from clinic, so hopefully it'll work. <laughs> All right, um, so what we're gonna talk about is how to do knee and shoulder injections, primarily the indications, how to do it, um, both for aspirations and injections into the knee, how to do it easily so it's very reproducible and your patients don't dislike you, and same thing for shoulder. Um, I personally don't do any elbow, ankle, um, Botox, uh, eyebrow injections, um, so we're gonna focus on knee and shoulder. So indications for knee aspiration and injection. Um, most common ones are either diagnostic. You want to rule out why they have an effusion, especially if you may have any concern on whether or not they may be infected. Um, anytime you're doing any diagnostic evaluation, you want to send for cell count, differential, crystals, and you should always send for a gram stain and culture just to cover your bases. If it's a younger, sexually active person, you also want to send for all those other things that can grow in the knee that we don't really talk about. Um, and then most commonly for us is therapeutic. We can use them to um, treat arthritis, crystal arthropathy, or different types of gout and pseudogout, and to a certain extent, inflammatory arthritis. Um, so first case is a 55-year-old computer scientist. He's had about three weeks of knee pain and swelling. He had two meniscus debridements, was told he had some mild arthritis a few years ago. He has a trip um, to Istanbul um, in two weeks. He wants to feel good. Thank you for those of you that recognize that joke. Um, and is asking for an injection. He also has lots of questions because he's a computer scientist. He wants to know if their injections are safe. He had one six months ago, another one three years ago. So the question is, is what defines too many injections for a patient? And I'll let you read all of these. All right, so three injections in one anatomic space is too many. Six injections into any space with articular cartilage is too many. And then a smattering, three injections anywhere in the body in a lifetime. So the answer is we don't know. There is absolutely zero data if injections are safe or not. So every time I have somebody come into a patient and goes, my doctor or my friend said that I can't have three injections because her back started hurting four years ago and then they got the injections and now she has the diabetes and the arthritis, tell them that's probably not really evidence-based. Um, so we don't have a good answer for how many injections are too many. So I caution you not to tell patients, well, you had an injection three months ago, therefore it's unsafe. You can say, you had an injection three months ago and it didn't really seem to help, maybe another injection is not necessarily beneficial. So I try to counsel my patients that we don't have enough data to say what's safe and what isn't. Um, the times that you don't want to do a corticosteroid injection, um, anytime you think that there may be an active joint infection, and oftentimes, at least in my clinic, a gout flare can look like an active joint infection. Um, anytime they have a big hemarthrosis, blood is basically a great way to get those few bacteria to start growing rapidly. Um, so if they have a big bloody effusion like they do after an ACL injury, doing a steroid injection to calm them down, not a great idea. Um, anytime they have overlying cellulitis, I don't know why you would do an injection, but every now and again we see it. Anytime there's a fracture, don't do it. Um, and in a, or in a prosthetic joint, so your patient comes in with a knee replacement and says, gosh, I just need it to calm down a little bit. Can I have a steroid injection? No, because that does increase the risk that they get an infection over time. And if that, inf if that infection happens, the joint has to come out, and it's a big problem. Um, relative contraindications, in theory, uh, corticosteroid injection within the past few months, probably not the best time to just do it again. 
Um, if they're coagulopathic and you don't want them bleeding all over the office, although it's a relative contraindication. Um, and poorly controlled diabetes. This is controversial. Some studies have shown that um, diabetes, um, blood sugars don't change with injections. Other studies have shown a transient bump up to about, like if you're at like 150 for your blood sugar, up to about 300 transiently. So poorly controlled diabetes that you're trying, like the knee's an afterthought, probably a good idea to not necessarily inject the knee. Um, for those of you that do injections, um, what is your preferred steroid injection? And don't ask me to pronounce B, C, or D, because those are really hard. Okay. Why do you guys use Kenalog? Fewer letters, good, okay, why else? Because you've seen a great treatment benefit, it works better than all the other ones. It's what you have in clinic, yeah, that's why most people use what they have. So I use Depamedrol, so these are the three that they have, I will tell you exactly why I use it. The Depamedrol is at this height in clinic, the Kenalog is at this height, and the other one I can't pronounce is over here, and then I'd have to stand on my toes, and sometimes I'm sweaty, and then you can see that I'm sweaty. So I pick the one that's lowest down, and because I use that, it works really well. When you compare head to head, there is no difference between these injections, okay? So if you look at most of the studies, the reason why there's a, comp when they say a corticosteroid versus hyaluronic acid, corticosteroid versus PRP, they don't specify is because there hasn't really been shown to be any difference between the different preparations. Their mechanism of action is all the same. Um, their, me ugh, their mechanism of action is not entirely known. It's probably that they inhibit both COX-2 and phospholipase A2, which are separate but um, similar inflammatory mediator, so they tend to block more of the pain pathways or anti-inflammatory pathways than your typical NSAID. Um, like we talked about a little bit earlier this morning, um, anesthetic injections cause cell death. Steroids don't cause cell death. So it's important to tell your patients that um, the, the um, times that you're going to cause cartilage death or chondrotoxicity is if you have the longer duration acting um, uh, anesthetic agents, the more acidic ones, particularly lidocaine, and more concentrated. So the 2% lidocaine is worse for you than the half percent or quarter percent. So most people, if they're doing a lot of injections, tend to take one of the more basic ones like ropivacaine or marcaine, dilute it with, with saline, and put steroid in and use a lot less. You need a very, very small amount of anesthetic for it to work, so you don't need a lot of it. Okay, um, we talked about this again earlier this morning, but our official recommendation for corticosteroids is that it's inconclusive in terms of causing real benefit for patients, and that's because not everybody gets benefit from corticosteroids. So the Academy of Orthopedic Surgery has come out and said, we can't say that we're either for or against it, which is our way of saying, go ahead and try it, but don't expect miracles. Um, a similar group, but uh, the Osteo uh, Osteoarthritis Research Society, which is a group that focuses more on non-operative management, says that the quality of evidence that, that is good for short-term pain relief, and I think that's a great statement to give your patients. A qualified group of cartilage ex experts say that it is a good treatment option for your short-term pain relief. I have a trip to Chile coming up. I want my knee to feel good. Therefore, this is a great option for that. It does not have a biologic effect. It does not regrow cartilage. Um, does a steroid mask pain? How many of you say, tell your patients, yeah, it masks pain, be careful? Awesome. Most of you can go home right now. Um, it does not mask pain. It decreases inflammation. I was just reviewing a little brochure on arthritis, and it said you must be, this is like from a famous publisher, it said you must be careful. Your, your, the steroids will mask pain for three months. You can cause more damage. It's not true. The numbing medicine, absolutely, for the first few hours. Um, but after that, the steroid, whatever effect you're getting from the steroid, you can tell your patient, absolutely, that is less inflammation in your knee. That's why you feel better. Um, this was an interesting article that came out last year and got a lot of press. It was actually on like the NBC Nightly News, and it was a study of triamcinolone versus saline, and they used high-resolution MRI to look at differences between saline injections and steroid injections. They randomized patients. It was a really well-done study. It was published in JAMA, and what they found was that there was more cartilage loss 
in the patients that had steroid injections. So in the nightly news, it said, oh my God, steroids are causing arthritis. Your cartilage is being eaten away. It sounds horrible. Um, the significantly more cartilage loss in that group was less than 0.4 millimeters on average. That is a very small amount. Think of like a half to a quarter millimeter. It was less than 0.4 millimeters um, overall in all compartments, sum total. So you might have 0.1 less in one compartment, 0.1 less in the other, and the pain differences were the same. So it, even though it was a, re the reason it was published in JAMA is a really well done study. And it does show a small but statistically different, um, between, st statistically different um, outcome between the two groups, but it may not be clinically relevant. So you have to be a little bit careful with how you read that. Um, the risks of steroid are really pretty low. Um, I've never actually seen an infection, which is what patients always worry about, especially when I tell them that I'm using my lucky needle, they get a little bit nervous. Um, the most common uh, complication I see is a post-injection steroid flare. So up to 10% of your patients will actually get a little bit worse for the few days afterwards. And it's important to tell your patients um, you may feel worse before you feel better. On average, it takes a steroid injection five to 10 days to kick in. I've even had patients that are 10 to 12 days before it kicks in. It will not work right away. And some patients do have do get a little bit worse before they get better. Um, the chance of septic arthritis is extraordinarily rare. Like I said, I think I've heard of one patient having it. I've never actually seen it. Um, so take home points for intraarticular steroid injections. They're good for short-term pain relief. They have a small effect on function. So they're, they're not gonna make you feel amazingly better, but they do seem to improve your gait. There's no evidence that they're gonna provide long-term pain relief. And the clinical effect of these um, is independent of the in, of inflammation present, meaning you can use it in the setting of an effusion. It will decrease inflammation. Um, in general, I tend to use them for my arthritic patients that don't really have another option. They're not ready for a joint replacement, can't have a knee scope, they can't take other medications. Every three to four months is about the most that I really want to do it. Okay, so this is a 63-year-old person. He's known history of arthritis. Um, he's had NSAIDs, PT, steroid injections. Last three injections haven't worked as well, and he would like to try something different but doesn't feel like he's ready for surgery. So what do you want to give him? For those of you with the stem cell clinic, you're kind of thinking, well, I know what I'm going to give. All right, interesting. Even though we said it didn't work this morning, mostly hyaluronic acid, knee replacement, awesome, budding surgeons, good. Um, so we're going to touch again a little bit on visco supplementation. I'm not going to beat this horse to, over the head too many times. It's a series of multiple injections. It's much more expensive. It is thought to decrease pain. Um, may work better for mild to moderate arthritis, which has been shown in most studies. Um, do, like we've talked about before, depending on who we talk to, either rheumatologists say it works pretty well, orthopedic surgeons say it doesn't work all that well. Um, but the study I wanted to get to was this one. This came out in the New England Journal. I thought this was a really nice study. They looked at the use and cost of hyaluronic acid in the United States, and they looked at a Medicare claims database of over a quarter million people. So what they found was that in the year that a patient gets a total knee, 25% of the costs leading up to that total knee are just on hyaluronic acid injections, and most patients have tried every possible alternative before having a total knee. So in that year, including the cost of a total knee, that's a $6,000 implant, quarter of your costs are just on your hyaluronic acid injections, and it didn't change whether or not they had a knee replacement. So what that study suggested um, was that, oops, ooh, no, not yet, not yet, yay. So what that study suggested was that maybe you've got to pick your hyaluronic acid patients uh, when they have early arthritis. Don't necessarily throw the kitchen sink in a cost-effective, it's not in a cost-effective manner to throw everything at your arthritic patients and say, let's try everything, let's prevent the knee replacement. December, you're getting a knee replacement anyway, okay? So bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, advanced, advanced degeneration, you've been following them for a while, not, that's not the time to spend all your money. Time at that point is counseling and how to get them through a knee replacement. Okay, so how much does a stem cell injection to the knee cost? Uh, 
All right. Interesting. A quarter of you think it's $10,000. <laughs> See me afterwards. <laughs> I'll do it for eight. All right. So this was a really nice study that came out. So there's a difference between PRP and stem cells. In fact, the difference, but this should be a whole different talk that we should probably start putting in this course because it's gonna, it gets more and more press. Platelet-rich plasma is a peripheral blood draw where they spin down your platelets and they get rid of everything else and re-inject essentially concentrated growth factors. Stem cell treatments are whatever they say they do at that stem cell center that they have a proprietary mix, but they are, have to be minimally modified cells, meaning they either take them from fat, bone marrow, or another part of your body, harvest the stem cells in any proprietary means, and then re-eject them, but they haven't done anything special to them, and it's probably less than 0.2% of the cells that they actually harvested. So this study, um, or this, this was um, quoted in the Washington Post a couple years ago now, where they went around to different clinics and asked, well, how much does PRP cost. So they found a pretty wide variety of $500 to $1,800 per treatment, but most centers recommended, well, for good effect, you need three treatments. Um, there were no studies that have shown marked improvements with PRP. There was no change in the natural history yet. So we haven't seen an MRI study that shows you've regrown cartilage. Um, but very few studies show significant complications. And like we talked about before, for certain patients, this might actually be a pretty good option. It may be more cost effective than visco supplementation. Well, this is my favorite. This is what happens when you Google. So I wanted to look up how much it would be for me to get a stem cell injection. So I went to Smart Choice because I would go someplace smart, and I want to get back in the game. Okay, so one stem cell procedure using whatever I choose. It's kind of like being at Counter Burger. I can pick fat or bone marrow. 5000 for the first joint. Two joints, you get a discount. Okay, shady, right? But my favorite is stem cell procedures for face and neck cosmetic enhancements. Um, dude, just do your spelling, start at 6,500, but if you're really worried, ED starts at 8,500. So notice mainly they're setting their own costs sort of on random basis. Like I'm guessing that this person is the most desperate. He comes in at a certain time and wants it. Spine, 6,500. They don't even say where in the spine that they're going to inject. And that's in general with most of these stem cell clinics. The reason why I don't have evidence-based anything to provide for you is because there is no evidence that these work, okay? So be careful for your patients that say, hey, I've heard about stem cells, not appreciatively, and said, me too, they're probably not ready for clinical trials yet. Um, so for the take-home points for these in general, um, we're really using hyaluronic acid injections less and less in our clinics. PRP has limited efficacy, but it does seem to be effective for the right patient. It is somewhat expensive, but over time, my guess in the next three to four years, insurances are going to start covering this. Um, and there's no data whatsoever for stem cell treatment. So when you're talking to patients, divide out the PRP talk and the stem cell talk. They tend to jumble them together and say, hey, and it's always like right before they leave, they're like, oh, well, what about PRP and stem cells? Can you give me your 20-minute discussion on like, ugh, don't get it. All right, so how to actually do a knee injection. Um, I'm going to go over this, and at the end of the talk, I'm going to, Jessica has been nice enough to say we can, we can all stab her in the knee with a needle. Um, so I try to keep everything as simple as possible. Sometimes I do as many as five or six injections in a given day. So I don't necessarily want like this big giant production. This is not, this has to be a clean, not a sterile procedure. So I have two alcohol swabs, a Band-Aid, some cold spray, and the injection which I mix outside the room so they do not see needles. Okay, so that's one of the key things is I try for patients never to see what I'm actually doing. Um, oh wait, that sounds bad. So I try them not to see the needle going into the skin so that they don't actually pass out. Okay, so how many of you do knee injections in clinic? All right, where do you inject the knee? I, I know, that's why the audience responds, but thank you. All right, I totally can't read that. D is anterolateral, good, anterior medial, so nice mix. So I'm gonna give you some evidence why you should do it in the superior lateral area, which is A. So a quarter of you have done it in an evidence-based approach. It's 
totally okay because if you went through rheumatology or internal medicine or family practice, most people are taught to go right through the fat pad. That's where we put our arthroscopic instruments, but we don't necessarily want to do that because there's a big fat pad there and your medicine may get caught up in the fat pad and never get to where it belongs. Um, so what I do is I have the patient lie down. I have them extend the knee. Sometimes if they're a little bit fluffy, I'll put a bump under the knee so it's a little bit bent. I find the superior border of the patella and the lateral border, and I go one centimeter above. And if I'm worried about finding it, I will mark it a little bit. Okay. So why do I do this? Well, if you look at the knee anatomy, if this is your kneecap here, there is a pouch above your knee where there is all this fluid and it's totally safe. You won't hit the kneecap, you won't hit fat. If you put the needle in here, you, it's, going to be, um, it's going to be the most accurate. The, also, <laughs> that's pretty cool, right? Um, there's also the least nerve endings up here. So if you muck about for a little bit, it doesn't hurt the patients nearly as much. Um, down here, there's fat. If you look at the accuracy, this was a study, a really simple study done by Doug Jackson many years ago. Oops. Uh -oh. Um, what he found was accuracy of placement, 93%, over nine, over 9 out of 10 times, you're going to get it in, no problem, compared to 71 or 75%. Still pretty good. You're getting it three quarters of the time. None of you were C students in college or med school, though. We want you all up here, right? So there is a difference for patients. And like I said, it's very easy because if you look at what happens clinically, this is where we put the needle in. This is what it looks like. There's all this space up here above your kneecap and trochlea. So there's lots of space to go up here where you won't hurt the patient and there's plenty of room to do it. All right, so what about shoulder injections? All right, if you're going to do an injection for frozen shoulder, where do you put the medicine? Hmm. Interesting. How many of you who said sub subacromial space get a good effect from that injection? And you're like, great, I don't need to see this patient again. <laughs> All right, okay. All right, so frozen shoulder is a problem of the glenohumeral joint. The subacromial space is separate from the glenohumeral joint. So even though there are plenty of orthopedic surgeons, plenty of radiologists, plenty of primary care doctors who will inject the subacromial space for frozen shoulder, I would argue that's why frozen shoulder patients don't always get better with an injection. When we do an injection into the glenohumeral joint, especially under x-ray visualization, so we make sure the needle goes in there or under ultrasound, almost always those patients get better. So my, I, what I would suggest to you for frozen shoulder, um, please inject the glenohumeral joint or send them to radiology because they tend to be very effective in getting rid of the pain. But plenty of people still do subacromial space. Okay, so for shoulder injections, there are multiple spaces in the shoulder to inject. The subacromial space is where you're going to do a majority of your injections. Um, to be perfectly honest, I don't do these injections down here because they're hard to hit, and I don't like my patients disliking me any more than they already have to. Subacromial space is a big space. Anybody with impingement, partial thickness tears, full thickness tears, bursitis, you're going to do that in the subacromial space, so that's what we're going to focus on. I would encourage you for these injections, I would encourage you to consider teaming up with a local radiologist who can do this under visualization. Um, glenohumeral joint, it's hard to get into the glenohumeral joint. It's hard even as an attending to get a camera into, the, into a tight glenohumeral joint. If they have frozen shoulder, it's hard for me to get anything in there, let alone a needle that's under with an awake patient. Your AC joint can be very small. If you miss and you're on top of the AC joint, you can get some fat necrosis and it can look a little bit funny and patients don't necessarily like that. And your, your, uh, for biceps tendonitis, um, I think it's hard to find the bicipital groove and not inject right into the tendon. So I usually rely on our radiologist or Dr. Luke to do that. So I'm going to focus on um, just one slide on glenohumeral injections for frozen shoulder. And I'm going to say if you read all of these studies, they all show that injections into the glenohumeral joint that were document, documented work better than PT alone, work great in combination with PT, and a vast majority of your patients will not need surgery for frozen shoulder. But you're going to hear a lot more about frozen shoulder tomorrow. Okay, so for subacromial steroid injections, we're going to focus on steroid injections. We'll talk a little bit about PRP, but if you fall asleep in the end because the food coma hits, PRP hasn't been shown to work. Steroids have been shown to work. All right, so 
um, 42 year old, oops, I gave away this one. Um, 42 year old, four month history of pain at night, pain with overhead activity, difficulty doing his exercises, positive rotator cuff impingement signs, but no weakness. What would you do for this guy? Okay, so A, B, C, D, D, P, T, and a subacromial injection of steroid, C, P, T, and NSENS for four weeks. So you can see it's pretty broad, um, and I would agree. I don't think there's any great perfect answer to say this is the right thing to do with this patient. Um, things that I look for, pain at night for me, um, I really like to sleep. If I'm losing sleep because my shoulder hurts, that's more of an indication that I might want to be a little bit more aggressive than, well, my shoulder hurts when I work out but I sleep fine at night. So that might push me towards doing an injection. Um, everything other than that, I think it's up to the patient. I really just, I try to lay out the options. Say you can do home exercises, you can do physical therapy if you're the kind of person needs a little bit more of a push. Um, we can try anti-inflammatories if you're gonna be consistent about taking the medication or we can do a steroid injection, but they're all reasonable answers. Um, I think for most people, having that informed dis discussion with them is enough for them to give them a reasonable amount of evidence to make their own decisions. Um, but we'll focus uh, for th this talk at least, you'll hear some of the other ones tomorrow on what the evidence is for steroid injections for subacromial impingement. Um, so this was a really nice study that was published four years ago now in Annals of Internal Medicine. They randomized patients to injection versus PT. Um, both groups got better. There were no side effects um, in either group, and both had equivalent improvement. But what's interesting is that the people that had the injections didn't use healthcare resources. So it was more cost effective in this study to just do an injection and do home exercises compared to sending them to physical therapy. And although phys physical therapy is a great resource, it probably is overutilized for some patients, um, especially the ones with unending insurances where, you know, sometimes you send patients to physical therapy, they go four times and everything seems good. And the other patient has gone like 37 times in two weeks. You're like, Geez, so you're going three times a day to physical therapy. <laughs> Who's paying? Um, so um, I think this study suggests that, like, especially for the right patient, maybe an injection and a good home exercise program or a single visit with physical therapy may be totally reasonable. Um, this was a study that came out a few years ago now in Journal of Shoulder Elbow Surgery. Again, randomized an NSAID injection to a steroid injection in 32 patients. Both groups improved. The NSAID patients got better a little bit faster, but there was no difference in terms of the mini minimally clinically um, incremental difference, or MCID, between the groups. So even though there was a statistical difference, both groups got better about the same. So they were both effective. Every now and again, patients will ask me, why aren't we doing other types of injections? I've heard about steroid injections from my grandparents. It's because they still work compared to all the new formulations. Um, this study was a while, a while ago now. Um, There's a meta-analysis of seven studies, but there was good evidence that unlike in the knee where it's a very good short-term relief, there was good evidence that steroid injections improved symptoms for up to nine years, sorry, nine months, and the number needed to treat for uh, efficacy was only 3.3. So that's pretty good. For most studies, yeah, a good number needed to treat is eight to 10. 3.3 is really good. Um, so what about imaging for a subacromial injection? So this study just came out um, um, in the last year. So they randomized patients to using landmarks, basically drawing out where to go, versus ultrasound. They found that both were pretty accurate. Your subacromial space is a really big space. Um, they found that an ultrasound, you, if you're using imaging, you should be 100% accurate. Um, but you were still 93.3% accurate in getting the injection into the right spot just by using landmarks. But both groups had equal benefit at all time points. So they said that even though ultrasound guided injections were a little bit more accurate, you probably don't need it. You're probably getting that needle. If it wasn't 100% accurate, you're probably right at the subacromial space for the other injections. And given the cost and expert, and the need for an expert for ultrasound, you probably don't necessarily need it for subacromial space injections. Um, we'll touch a little bit on PRP. It works for everything. My personal favorite, better self-image. That's awesome. 
There's no shame in that ad. Um, we do tend to get patients, especially in sports medicine clinics, that will cite their favorite athlete and say how they went to Germany, got a miracle injection, and came back. And you really have to tell them, dude, you do not know what happens in Germany, okay? It's like the, it's like the uh, European Vegas. We have no idea what they're actually being injected over there. But they're also full-time athletes getting great injections. One of you just looked really suspicious at me, and you look kind of German, so I totally am sorry. Um, <laughs> So, but in general, no matter how earnest this gentleman looks, um, there is really not that much evidence that PRP for sh shoulder works very well. And this has actually been studied pretty well. Um, uh, this was a study um, out of Europe that looked at uh, PRP for tendinopathy and partial thickness cuff tears. Um, they randomized patients to steroids or PRP. They found no difference at six months um, between the two groups and no difference in MRI findings. So there was no biologic effect. Their uh, initial hypothesis was that they were going to see a biologic effect or decrease in tendinopathy with the PRP group. And they did not see that. So it didn't seem to be creating a biologic effect. Um, this study came out um, three years ago now, again, a European group, and what they found was a small but significant improvement in PRP in patients with tendinopathy at three months, but it did not reach the minimally clinically important difference, and there is no difference at six months comparing um, ster uh, steroid to PRP. So again, it didn't seem to be all that beneficial. Um, in this study, again, no difference between exercise and physical therapy at one year. So it kind of backs up what the other studies show, that none of these things work any better than just exercise, a steroid injection, anti-inflammatories. That's why when we asked that question, everybody had a relatively reasonable answer for what you would treat that patient for. I um, mean, this was the last study, the non-randomized study, um, for steroid versus PRP. The steroid injections were actually doing better, especially at early time points, um, but also a little bit better at six months, but it was non-randomized, um, so it's hard to draw the same conclusions. Um, so how do I do a, st a steroid injection in the subacromial space? I have the exact same setup as an E. I have two alcohol pads. I have the patient face away from me. Um, I find the posterior lateral border of the acromion. I go just in front of it. Um, this was written up by Rick Martyr, who's at UC Davis. He finds it's a little bit more accurate that way. And then I basically put my finger on the coracoid, aim for the coracoid, and, and say a Hail Mary, and usually it works. All right, so this is kind of what we're talking about. So this is classically what we're taught. So this is posterior. Um, so this is the posterior border of the acromion. This is what, the way I was taught in med school and residency is, and I will still do this if patients I think are gonna be really nervous about it, but you enter from behind and aim again to the coracoid up here. The problem is, especially for your fluffier patients, this is a long way for the needle to go. And for really big patients, the posterior border of the acromion is hard to find. And I always feel kind of awkward being like, I can't, nope, I'm still not that, still not it. And then I'm not exactly sure where that needle is going. Laterally, the landmarks are a little bit easier. So this is what I typically do now. I go a little bit Bit more posterior to where this one is. I kind of go right here. I'm still out of eyesight. This nice gentleman cannot see the needle going in. And then I put my finger on the coracoid and kind of aim right in that direction. That's also exactly the trajectory if I'm doing any arthroscopic work. So it feels very comfortable for me to put a needle in the same direction where I'm usually working. All right. So I'm going to have my volunteer come up and my camera person come up. And then, yeah. Huh. I've never actually injected somebody live, so I probably won't do that for real. But we'll just go over landmarks. How's your knee today? It hurts. It's going to be worse after. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Just kidding, sort of. Um, all right. Um, so what I do is I usually have a patient lay down. I do confirm what side it is. I always say, I know this is a stupid question, but please tell me what we're doing for you. Um, Mainly because I don't, I, there have been occasional incidents when people kind of come in, they have seven body parts that are bothering them, and then they say, um, and then we talk about both sides in there, and you're injecting my knee, and you have to, oh, crap, um, I don't always remember, so I always make them double check, but I don't mark the leg or anything like we do when we have surgery. Uh, let's see, oh, a really tiny syringe, oh, you're lucky. Okay, so if I'm going to do this, Usually what I do before the room, I mean, if we're going to be very complete, what I do is I have an 18-gauge needle outside the room. Um, I talk to the athletic trainers while I'm doing that. I throw the wrong things in the wrong trash usually, and I get yelled at. Um, Accurate so far? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So this is horse tranquilizer. Okay, good. Um, so, I mean, this is xylocaine. I usually draw up as little as possible. So... 
Um, if I'm going to inject a knee, I usually use about two cc's of that. And then this is Depomedrol, which is 40 milligrams. It comes in 40 or 80 milligrams. Per, and then you usually get about two cc's. So I inject this in. And then all of it goes in, and then all of it comes back out. If you do this and then get distracted, and then it sits in the room for a while, just shake it again, because it will ki kind of condense in. Um, and then I switch to a smaller needle. This is still a big needle, but that's OK, because she doesn't know. Um, so I usually use a 22 gauge for injection. Sorry, I'll turn over here. I keep facing that, because I've got like three cameras on me, so it's really confusing. It's like high school again. Um, OK. so. I know, no one got that. That's probably good. So then what I usually do um, is I try to block the patient from everything that I'm doing. But the landmarks that I'm going to use, and I'm not really going to inject you. Okay. The landmarks I'm going to use is this is top of the patella right here. Okay. So and then this is lateral border of the patella. Um, pick your legs up. And then put them there. Good. And then I can get them to totally relax by sitting on a pillow or a towel. And then if you look closely, when I push the kneecap over, there, her kneecap goes up to here. That means I have all this space up here, about two finger breaths above the kneecap, that I'm going to be able to safely do the injection. Um, you guys didn't bring cold spray, did you? Ooh. Oh, cool. OK. No pun intended. All right, so no, we lost one. Um, so when I'm doing the knee, knee injection, I don't use betadine. It hasn't been shown to be any better. But I do a couple things, and I tell the patient what I'm doing. I say, I'm going to clean your skin with alcohol. I'm going to let the alcohol dry. We do that for two reasons. First, if you ever think about getting alcohol in, an, in a cut, it hurts like crazy, right? Well, it doesn't feel any better if you wipe it down and then shove a needle through it. It hurts just as much. That's why your kids hate getting shots, because um, that's exactly what they do. Think about it. You, get, you bring your kid in. They wipe it. They say, this one's going to hurt. Yeah, it is, because you've got wet alcohol going into the wound. So I let it dry. It also kills more bacteria if it's dry. And then I take um, either ethyl chloride or this stuff, um, which is mist spray, ethyl chloride. But it either comes in like the thing that you can direct from 10 feet away, or this one, which is a broader spray. And then I keep where, wherever my landmark is, I just want to spray right there. And you keep it about six inches away until it looks cold and frosty. OK? And then I'm, not, I'm literally not going to inject you, I think. Um, and then I just poke right in. And what you usually feel is two things. You feel skin, and then you'll feel it go through the capsule. And that's a legitimate poke. If they're going to shriek, it's going to be at the capsule, because the capsule, especially in an inflamed knee, is going to hurt a little bit. So basically, alcohol, dry, 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 let it dry, talk to the patient, distract them, little bit of cold spray. They worry about the cold spray. They wonder what it is. By the time the cold spray stopped, inject in like that. Go quickly, and you will be done in under 10 seconds, OK? If you, if you have a bigger patient, um, or sorry, if you have a patient that's nervous about the injection, use a bigger, not smaller needle, because you'll get the medicine in faster. It's not an appreciable pain difference. And that way, you're not in the knee for a long period of time. And I usually, so my patients, I think I need to be in and out of the body part quickly. I'll use a 20. For most patients, I'll use a 22. And those should be readily available. They're all normally the same length, which is? I think two inches or an uh, inch and a half. Questions so far on that? Who wants to do it to Jessica? <laughs> Drew. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, OK, moving on. Shoulder. Come on, sit up. All right. Again, this is what happens when you only have one needle. Um, so I do the exact same. I do the exact same setup. What I do is I usually have them on my stool in clinic, um, but just face that way a little bit. Yeah, perfect. Um, Hold on one sec. Let me see if I can draw a little bit. OK, so if, if we look at um, Jessica's arm, sorry, this is the posterior border of her acromion. OK, and you can feel that. That's that little tip back here. Anterior tip is right there. Coracoid is that bump right here. OK, so if classically, I would be going back here and aiming up. The problem is I can hit bone. If, if Jessica had a big arm, if she had a non-muscly arm and there was more skin back here, you can actually be above the acromion, which is not a great place to be. So usually where I go is right about here. Okay? So same thing, we would do lots of alcohol, clean it up. I put my finger on their coracoid right about now, and I just keep it there. Spray lots of cold spray. 
and then aim for my finger, okay? The reason why I always try to aim for something on the body is your body is, your hand, and your hand is much better at aiming if it knows a uh, target. If I put my hand like this, I'm not nearly as accurate. If I say aim to my finger here, I'm almost always gonna be able to get right there, okay? I don't know a good way to practice this on yourself, but it totally works. It works when we teach trauma and triangulation. If I want a guide pin to go in a certain location, if the resident puts their hand there, they will hit that location almost every time versus if you try to do it one-handed. So it works really well. Feel the coracoid, put it right, right in front of the tip here, and then aim straight. If you aim up, you're going to hit bone. If you aim down, you're going to hit bone. If you aim straight, you're going to be totally fine. Okay? Same thing. Inject quickly, band-aid, and let them go on their way. Okay? All right. How many of you feel at least slightly more confident to do this in clinic? Make me feel good. Everybody raise their hand. There you go. Practice. Find your patients. Ask them if they want an injection. Um, I, I don't coerce them, but it's not a bad idea. It's really, really easy to do. One of the reasons why I like doing injections, you know, some orthopedic surgeons will get patients in clinic and then say, well, gosh, um, I don't really do injections. I'm going to have you go see somebody else. So a patient comes all this way to see me. And then if I can't provide them anything other than a referral, that's not necessarily a good use of their time. Um, so I really, if they really have come all that way for any sort of treatment and all I give them is a prescription for physical therapy and uh, go see somebody else for an injection, it's not th that beneficial. So I would encourage you, if a patient comes in, after you go to this course, you feel more comfortable treating musculoskeletal problems, inject them, make them feel better for the right indications, and they will thank you. They don't need to come and see me for an injection unless they want some sort of humorous um, anecdote while they're getting their injection.